So ragtime guitar is a term you hear thrown around a lot, and it's confusing because it's not really the same thing as the ragtime music composed by people like Scott Joplin for the piano around the turn of the 20th century. And it's not blues in the sense that it's not a shuffle, it's not a 12 bar form, it doesn't sound like what you think when you hear the word blues. But ragtime guitar and ragtime guitar playing was a huge part of the pre-war blues sound. People like Blind Boy Fuller and some of Blind Blake's things and even a lot of Reverend Gary Davis stuff is considered part of the ragtime guitar world. So the thing about it is because it is different from the kind of Delta blues stuff you might play with a steady bass and because it doesn't have the same kind of chord progressions as maybe the Mississippi John Hurt kind of alternating thumb playing, it's another kind of blues sound that you can add to your repertoire and therefore have yet more variety between 12 bar blues, eight bar blues, alternating thumbs, steady bass. You add in some ragtime chord progressions and now you've got a whole other way to, um, to vary things inside of your repertoire. So in this lesson, I'm just gonna take you through a few steps to get up and running on a kind of typical classic eight bar ragtime guitar progression. If you're a fingerstyle blues guitar player and you're looking for a more organized, ongoing way to learn new tunes and turn those tunes into complete songs and even start to improvise on them, I recommend checking out my membership, The Fingerstyle 5, which you can learn more about at the link below or the link on screen. So we're going to go through this in three steps. First, we'll look at the chord progression. Next, we'll look at the bass, what the thumb's got to do to play that chord progression. And finally, we'll look at some syncopations, what the fingers need to do against that alternating bass to get the ragtime guitar sound. So we're gonna use these four chords, A7, D7, which this is the D7 that just looks like a C7 that's been slid up two frets, and then G7, and then finally C. So we're in the key of C, but the chord progression starts off, you start off with these two bars of A7, and then two bars of D7, two bars of G7, and two bars of C. And the logic behind the chord progression is that you're basically, from the beginning of the first measure, you're slowly working your way in a circle around to the C chord at the end. So you're moving, circle of fifths, the A7, this is the five chord of D. So this A7 chord is resolving to D7. But this D7 is the five chord of G. So the D7 is leading you to the G7. And then this G7 is the five of C. So even though, you know, if you go and learn diatonic harmony and what that one, four, and five are major and two, three, and six are minor and all that. Um, you know, the A is not supposed to be major or dominant seventh in the key of C, but it's being borrowed to take you to the D7 chord. The D7 also doesn't belong in the key of C, but it's being borrowed to take you to the G chord. Now the G chord is finally the first legit chord in the key of C that we've got. This is the five chord of C. And so then you get back to C. And so there's this kind of inevitability to the way the chords cycle around. And because every chord is a fifth away from the next chord, it's part of what's considered the circle of fifths. So there's your chord progression. That's step one, just knowing that it's two bars of A7, two bars of D7, two bars of G7, and two bars of C. So. It's this up-tempo, alternating thumb approach, so what do you have to do? Step two is the question, what do you have to do with the thumb to provide the groove and to take you through the chord progression? Because since we're playing finger style, what the thumb is doing is setting the tempo, it's telling you the chord progression, it's doing everything that the rhythm section in an ensemble would do. So we're going to have the, the bass alternating between the fifth string and the fourth string, and then the sixth string and the fourth string on the A chord. So, and I'm doing some palm muting, just letting my palm rest right where the strings meet the bridge. So, 
that's one measure, right? One, two, three, four. So we have two of those. And then we go to the D chord. And there's a couple different ways you can do this, but you're going to again go from the fifth string to the fourth string and then to the sixth string and the fourth string. And so you're gonna move your ring finger over from the fifth string to the fourth string on beat three. And one of the reasons that it works to do that is because you don't really want everything ringing out, right? Even if you could hold down both these strings, which I can barely do, but... Like, you don't want the sound of all those bass notes ringing out on top of each other. You want to kind of hear one note at a time. And if you lift your finger up to move it over to the sixth string, and then you're lifting it up to bring it back, that's going to cut off the bass note, and so you're going to hear the fifth string, and then the fourth string, and then the sixth string, and the fourth string. And I'm kind of relaxing my grip after each one. I'm not sure I would do that when I'm actually playing the melody. We'll see when we get there. But either way, it gives you... Yeah, I'm not really. I'm not lifting my fingers off, except for the ring finger. Right? But it gives it the bass more definition. So, fifth string, fourth string, fifth string, fourth string, sixth string, fourth string. Then the same thing up here. Then down to the G where the bass is already on the sixth string. So it's just going to be sixth string and fourth string on beats one, two, three, four. And you have that twice. So. And then we're back to the C, which we haven't hitting the C for the first time in measure seven. And we're going to do the same thing we did with the D7, which is to rock the ring finger over to the sixth string. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So what you can do is you've got the chord progression. You've got the thumb taking care of the groove. You can just start by making sure that you can lay down the groove over those chords, maybe even with a metronome call me crazy, but set it up so that you're just practicing getting from chord to chord, playing it reliably, and laying out the foundation for what you're gonna do, like that. So that's step two, and then step three, I'm gonna start to put some syncopations on top. That means getting the fingers involved. And we're gonna start with this version of the A chord. It's a bit of a stretch, but it's one of those chords that's great to know for playing all kinds of blues stuff. So um, even if it's a little tricky to play, I encourage you to start messing around with it. If it's really just, just can't do it. Try capoing up around the third fret, and then this reach, you know, the frets are closer together, of course, as you get further up the neck. So if you try capoing at the third fret, and just playing all the same chord shapes, then this A will be less of a stretch, right? Because the frets are closer together here than they are down here. And then, you know, if you can get that to work, you can slowly just move the capo down every week or two, and hopefully your fingers will start to stretch out. You never want to just like uh, do something that's like really uncomfortable and agonizing because, you know, you'll start to concentrate and get in the groove and work on it, and then you'll like let go with your hand and realize like, ooh, bad things are happening over here. You know, my hand's stretched out, it's cramped, uh, you know, you go back the next day and suddenly it hurts to do it. You don't want that. So even capo with the fifth fret, if that helps, just find a place where you can get this comfortably and then just slowly slide it back down over time. So we've got this A chord with the root on top. And for the most part, you can use a standard assignment of index finger on the third string and middle finger on the second string and ring finger on the high string. So if you're going to play this note on top, you're going to be using your ring finger. And syncopation is just the idea that not all of the notes you're playing are going to be on strong beats, on one, two, three, or four. Some of the notes you play are going to be on the ands, like one, and, two, and, three, and, four, and. But we can start out in the first measure playing the bass on one, and then a pinch between the high string and the fourth string on beat two. And then play beat three in the bass, 
and then play the high string on the and of three, and then come back in with the bass on four. And I know that's like a very sort of clinical way to describe what's going on, but if you're new to putting your fingers together with the thumb, or you're having trouble, you know, keeping the thumb consistent when you start to add the fingers in, one way to really get clear about what's going on is to look at the thumb as this, you know, calibration of one, two, three, four, and then just look at what's going on with your fingers as well. The finger's either playing with the thumb in a pinch or it's playing in between on one of the ands. So for this first measure, you could play one, two, three, and four. And then it's just a series of events, right? Bass, pinch, bass, and bass. And then you could follow that up in the second measure with a pinch on one and three. So there's really just one syncopated note, one note that's not being played with the thumb over those two measures. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, four. But that one syncopation, starting on B2 and then playing on the end of three, is enough to give the whole thing the feeling that it wants to have. And then we can go to the D chord and we can do the same kind of thing, the same rhythm. So I'm still playing two and one, two, three, four. But I'm up here on the D chord and for the first couple of notes, I'm playing the first fret, uh, sorry, the third fret on the second string. So one, two, three, and four. Right, so you can start with just that first measure. And then the next measure, measure four, you're gonna play a pinch on one, and then a pinch on three. So that gives us So together we have now we go to G, we can just do the same thing that we did on A, basically, except that the thumb is now just going 6-4, 6-4, but the top can be right, it's just going from the root to the flat seven. So one, two. to see we can just land on the high string right so that one syncopation applied to those three chords gives us this and then in that last bar of C we've got so bar seven is one two eight is one. We can then, if you want, do this walk down, down to the A to bring us back around to the beginning of the progression. So we've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we're going to repeat the C on beat two. And so then, taking all that around, That's more than enough to get started with. But if you want to take it a little further, here are a couple other things you can try. First, you can take that basic syncopation and you can add in a note on the second string right between measures one and measure two like this. So what I'm doing is literally playing one, two, three, and four, so I'm just adding in, I'm using the middle finger to pick the second string on the and of four in that first measure. So.
and then you're going right into a pinch on the downbeat of the next measure. So that note on the second string kind of kicks you into that next downbeat. And you can do the same thing on the D chord. gives us this. So that's one thing you can add. Another is I am doing kind of a, a thing with the chords. To make everything a little more staccato and a little more percussive. And all I'm doing is relaxing my grip on the strings without actually letting go, letting go of the chord. So and it tends to be on beat two or on beat two and beat four, which are the backbeat, which is the thing that makes Roots music groove, right? Right, so if you go to play the A chord and on beat two, you just kind of relax the grip right after you pinch. It makes things more percussive than just playing, which also sounds totally cool, but. And then if you relax your grip in the second measure on beat two, as you go to play the fourth string, you relax your grip. And on beat four, you relax your grip. You get this kind of choked sound on the fourth string, which also gives it more percussive, a more percussive quality. So. And a little goes a long way, like you might want to not do this all the time. But that's, that's where some of that sound comes from as I go and play through the chord progression. So I slow it down, it sounds like this. Obviously doing it on the G chord, you need other strategies than just relaxing your grip. And I'm sort of just flattening out my finger across the strings to get some of that percussive quality too. And finally, we've kind of been leaving that C chord, bar seven and eight, or really just bar seven because we have this walk down in bar eight. We've kind of been leaving that first measure of C as open space. Which is cool. I mean, you gotta have some contrast, right? And if you're gonna be playing through those first six bars, it's nice to have a little breathing room there when you get to the C chord. But since it is open space, and we are guitar players, here are a couple ways you might fill it. Both of them uh, are a kind of stop time, meaning you play uh, a chord or a bass note or a hit on the downbeat, and then you don't worry about keeping the bass going underneath while you play some kind of single note lick and then you come back in with the groove at a certain point. So because we've got this walk down in measure eight, we could just play a one bar fill. So we could play something like that. So we get to the C and on the downbeat of measure seven, the beginning of the C chord, play the bass with your thumb, play the fifth on top, third fret on the high string, and then So it 
just fills up that first measure. Maybe you play this one note. It really resolves here on the C. But to sort of connect the lick up to the walk down, you can play one and at the beginning of that measure, playing the C and then the G on the third string, and it kind of rolls you into that walk down. And so the lick itself, you're gonna grab, here's the ring finger playing the root, and here's your pinky playing the melody. You can slide up to the sixth, pull off to the fifth, over to the flat third, major third, root, six, pull off to the five, root, and then maybe the fifth again, and then you're into the walk down. So, Then, if you wanted to fill up both measures, you could just keep that lick going. And so now we're going from here. Here's the root, we're beginning measure eight. Root, five, six, hammer on. Root, six, pull off to the fifth. Flat three, hammer on to the three. Maybe even slide up with the index finger so that you get into position for this A chord. So. And so on. So if we put all that together, one last time, it sounds kind of like this. I just remembered one other thing I really wanted to point out. This I definitely nicked straight from watching Roy play, Roy Bookbinder, and it's this anticipation of the bass line. And we just gotta talk about this because it's cool. So. So it's just going into the D chord and going into the G chord. But what it is is on beat four of the second measure, of whatever chord you're on. You do this thing of, so we're on the A chord to begin with. So one, two, I can't do the syncopation and count at the same time, but one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I guess you could go into the C too. Right? But then it's sort of putting it together with everything else. So one. So one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So you let go of the bass. going into the D. And it's another kind of syncopation because you're putting a lot of weight on beat four and again beat four. So even though that's not the and of something, it's still emphasis in an unexpected spot, which is kind of what syncopation is all about. So, and you, you want to play this note with a little bit of an accent really kind of snap it, almost get under the string a little bit and lean, like, you know, rock your hand so that you're um, sort of bracing yourself on the low string and pulling up to get a bit of a snap. Here 
again, you're just kind of rolling back, so your thumb is almost pulling away from the guitar. Okay, so that's a lot of different things about playing uh, a ragtime guitar groove. Got a little carried away there with some extra stuff that I really wanted to talk about. But those first three steps are the first three steps you need to get going. What is the chord progression? What does your thumb have to do? How do you start putting some basic syncopations on top of that bass line? And that's kind of true for just about any kind of fingerstop blues thing you want to learn. You always want to go through those steps of, you know, what's the progression and the form, you know, what the chords are are we playing and is it eight bars, 12 bars? So you can start to kind of think about how to divide those measures up and keep track of them in your head. What does the thumb need to do? You know, just really getting clear so that you're not fumbling around with the bass, but can really dial that in and make sure you're playing accurate bass notes, which is part of playing, uh, you know, a really compelling groove is playing the notes, putting, knowing that you're putting the notes where you want to put them. And then finally, uh, getting your fingers to sync with the thumb being able to keep the thumb going reliably as you add things to it. And that is just a matter of breaking it down in terms of the beat, seeing the thumb as the anchor of the rhythm section, seeing the thumb as calibrating the groove and where the beats are, and then looking at the fingers in relation to the, th to the thumb so you always know where you are within the measure and within the beats. You know, are you on the strong beats? Are you on the ands? All that kind of stuff. So I hope you have fun working on this, adding the ragtime guitar uh, chord progression, a ragtime guitar chord progression in your playing is a really fun thing to add to your repertoire. So once again, if you are interested in a more organized, ongoing way to add tunes to your repertoire, turn those tunes into complete songs, learn how to improvise on those songs, I recommend checking out my membership at the Fingerstyle 5 at the link below or the link on screen. If you've got a question or a comment about today's lesson, I would love to hear from you. Leave it in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time.